Okay. 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 Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Ongi and I will be presenting pseudo tumor cerebri um, with normal pressure variant. Okay, I'll start with this outline introduction and epidemiology, issue pathogenesis, the clinical features, diagnosis, management, and then prognosis and summary. Um, pseudo tumor cerebri is a disorder defined by the clinical criteria that includes symptoms and signs. Isolated those produced by increased intracranial pressure, such as headache, vision, loss, papilledema. And then um, it also has elevated intracranial pressure with normal CSF composition, and there is no other cause of intracranial hypertension evidence or neuroimaging. It's also known as idiopathic intracranial hypertension because we don't have any structural cause. And a variant of it, known as the normal pressure pseudotumor cerebri, has the same features, except that it has a normal CSF opening pressure. An incidence is about 0.9 to 1 per 100,000. It's commoner in women than men, commoner in obese women, and commoner in women of childbearing age. It's probably due to the hormones involved at that time. And although it can present at any age, it's usually presented in the third decade of life. And men with um, pseudotumor cerebri are twice as likely as women to develop visual, to lose their visual function as a result of papilledema, probably because of late diagnosis, as it is not that common in men and it might not be diagnosed on time. It can also occur in the pediatric population and these patients are not obese. It has no racial or ethnic predilection. So the tumor cerebral does not have any known cause and um, patients with higher BMI and recent weight gain have been shown to be at increased risk. So some of the risk factors, if you have, if you have a patient who is not overweight and presents with typical features of pseudotumor cerebri, such as the headache and an um, ophthalmoscopic examination shows um, papilledema, the following have to be ruled out. Exposure to or withdrawal from certain substances such as steroids, growth hormone, vitamin A. Vitamin A has been postulated to be seen in the CSF of um, patients with pseudotumor cerebri. However, they haven't a link showing how it causes it has not yet been established. Systemic diseases such as anemia, chronic kidney disease, um, SLE, multiple sclerosis, and then disruption of cerebral venous flow, such as um, venous sinusthrombosis and also stenosis and dural fistula. And then certain endocrine metabolic disorders such as PCOS, Addison's disease have to be ruled out. Also increased venous red blood cell aggregation and relatively elevated fibrinogen concentrations have been demonstrated in patients with pseudotumor cerebri as compared to match control subjects. And then the ratio of retinols, retinol binding protein, this is where the vitamin A comes in. It has also been shown to be elevated in CSF of patients with um, pseudotumor cerebri as compared with non-neurological, non-IH neurological control subjects and with normal control subjects. The most common clinical features the headache, transient visual obscuration such as gray, gray vision, blood vision, um, pulsatile tinnitus, photopsia such as flashes of light, back pain, retrobulbar pain, diplopia, and sustained visual loss. And the most common signs were papilledema, which can be graded in severity using the present scale, which is important for prognosis, visual field loss, and um, adjacent nerve faulting. So this is the prison skill for breathing papilledema. It's long, so I'll just show you pictures instead. So this is normal optic disease. You can see the blood vessels here. There's no, um, and then the optic scope is not swollen. But in grade one, you can also see the C-shaped halo of the disc edema. Um, let me take this. With a temporal gap here. By grade two, the edema is circumferential, and see, and then by grade three, there's obscuration of a major blood vessel that is leaving the optic, the optic disc. By grade four, there's the major vessel is obscurated from the optic disc even without it leaving, and by grade five, you can see partial obscuration of all the major blood vessels. And then the variant of pseudotumor cerebri has the same features except for the normal opening pressure. Normal opening pressure is about, is between 10 to 25 centimeter of water. 
So um, a study that I noted because I couldn't find much data on it. However, um, a study came to the following conclusions on normal pressure to the tumor cerebri that a single lumbar puncture is neither diagnostic nor exclusive in suspected cases. Open, pre open pressure measured during lumbar puncture is actually a snapshot of a highly dynamic process and the results of the open pressure measurement must be correlated with clinical history, clinical signs, and symptoms of the patients and results of follow-up studies. And although um, increased open pressure has been is a criteria for diagnosing to the tumor cerebri, it should also be kept in mind that some patients up to this are more susceptible to lower um, intracranial um, pressure than others. And even when a patient's ICP is within normal range, the possibility should always be considered in a patient that has the clinical, typical clinical features, such as the papilledema, headache, and tinnitus, and blind spot and enlargement by visual field testing. So prompt diagnosis and treatment are essential to preserve vision. These patients are also treated with um, carbonic anhydrase in inhibitors, such as acetazolamide, and clinical improvement has also been shown in these patients with so-called normal pressure pseudotumor cerebri. So the diagnosis is um, done according to the modified Dandy criteria, um, which is symptoms and signs of raised intracranial pressure, such as the headache, tinnitus, papilledema, no other neurologic abnormalities or impaired level of consciousness, elevated intracranial pressure with normal CSF composition, and a neuroimaging study that shows no cause for intracranial hypertension, and then no other cause of intracranial hypertension apparent. Diagnosis is done with CT scan to rule out any structural abnormalities that might be causing the raised pressure. MRI with MRI venography, which is the gold standard because it helps to look at the cerebral veins and make sure there's no stenosis or thrombosis in the cerebral veins, which has been postulated to be a cause of pseudotumor cerebri. Then lumbar puncture is done for measurement of the opium pressure and CSF analysis with cell counts, um, um, gram stain, and protein and glucose concentration. Um, ophthalmic, ophthalm, ophthalmologic evaluation is um, required to document the severity of the optic nerve involvement and is also done to measure the treatment measure response to treatment. Then orbital ultrasound and fluorescent angiography can be done if after the ophthalmology evaluation, papilledema is not readily diagnosed. BP measurement is also important because patients with um, marginal hypertension with optic neuropathy may also present with headaches and papilledema. So it's important to measure their um, systemic BP. Also blood tests such as CBC, this is to rule out anemia, because has been shown that some patients with anemia when the anemia has been corrected, pseudotumor cerebral has improved. C-reactive protein for inflammatory causes and anti-cardiolipin antibodies and antiphospholipid antibodies for um, causes of thrombosis. So this is an MRI showing the first two pictures, A and B, show normal um, brain imaging. Then you see, you can see a partially empty cellar, which is actually seen in 70% of patients with pseudotumor cerebral because it's not known. And then in D, you can see the, um, the toxicity of the optic nerves. And in E and F, you can see that the right transverse sinus is a little bit enlarged. Oh, sorry, the left transverse sinus is a little bit enlarged. No, it's right. No, the management goals that's right here. The management goals include aggravation of uh, two major goals, aggravation of symptoms, usually headache, and the preservation of vision. And then any potential agents that might cause or worsen it may have to be discontinued. Tetracyclines have been shown to increase pressure. So if the patient is on a tetracycline derivative, it has to be discontinued. And then patients should be questioned also regarding symptoms of sleep apnea because they have been shown to worsen so too much cerebral symptoms and diagnostic sleep study and treatment should be done where appropriate. Low sodium weight reduction program is recommended for all obese patients and appears to alleviate the symptoms and signs in many patients. And medical treatment for so too much cerebral starts with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors such as acetazolamide, which has been shown to reduce the CSF pressure and improve vision. Loop directives such as furosemide can also be used and this has, when a um, patient does not have a complete response to acetazolamide. As I mentioned earlier, iron supplementation can be given in, to patients with IIH who have iron deficiency because it's shown to be um, efficacious. 
in a case series. And then two main surgical procedures are optic nerve sheet penetration and CSF shunting procedures. Surgical management is indicated when there is incomplete response, progressive visual loss, incomplete response to medical treatment, progressive visual loss, and intractable symptoms of headache. The optic nerve sheet penetration surgery is done to improve vision and it has been shown to improve vision loss in patients who already have facial edema. CSF shunting procedures such as ventricular peritoneal shunt and lumbar peritoneal shunt have also been done and been shown to reduce the um, headaches, CSF, to reduce CSF pressure and reduce the headaches. Cerebral venous sinus stenting is, is still kind of controversial, but people um, have been postulating it because some of the patients with so tumor cerebral have been shown to have um, stenosis of some of the cerebral veins. And so they postulated that if we can stent these veins, it might improve the pressure. Treatments that have a limited role are steroids and serial lumbar punctures. Steroids are not advocated because steroids cause weight gain, obviously, and withdrawal from steroids can cause intractable headache, which can worsen the symptoms of pseudotumor cerebri. Then steroid, but however, steroid, um, steroid can be used as like an adjunct before surgery to help to reduce the pressure, but it's not a long-term treatment. Steroid lumbar punctures have not really been shown to benefit patients because CSF reforms in about six hours, and also it has the risk of infections and um, CSF leak, which can also cause a, a continuous headache for these patients. But it can also be used just like the corticoids to as a temporizing measure before surgery. If um, the patient does not respond to um, medical treatments like acetazolamide. So the prognosis, um, there's no large perspective series that describes the natural history of this. And a protracted course, usually lasting months to years, appears to be common. And in most patients, symptoms worsen slowly. However, with treatment, they usually gradual improvement and stabilization, but not recovery. And many patients have persistent papilledema, elevated ICP, and residual visual fluid deficits. The risk factors for a, a poor prognosis are decreasing with three to five papilledema that I showed earlier, and significant visual loss at presentation, male gender, systemic hypertension, anemia, black race, younger age, or onset in puberty, and more severe obesity or recent weight gain, higher opening pressure on lumbar puncture too. The presence or absence of findings on MRI has not been shown to be to predict prognosis in any way. And a feature of good prognosis is the absence of papilledema on endoscopic examination. So in summary, the pathogenesis of pseudotumor cerebri is unknown and is typically presents in an obese woman of childbearing age who presents with headache with papilledema on examination. And a neuroimaging study is usually needed to exclude other causes of um, elevated intracranial pressure, such as tumors, before a diagnosis of pseudotumor cerebral can be made. And then medical and surgical treatments are based on the patient's presentation. Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation. I have a question. <clears throat> how, do you yes. how do you diagnose uh, uh, pseudotumor cerebri with, normal, with a normal visual field, with normal vision? The, the, pardon me where the, uh, there's no papilledema. You look in the eyes and it's normal. How do you jump to the diagnosis? I didn't see that way. So if there's headache, the patient has other symptoms like tinnitus. And even if you do a visual examination and the, um, the visual field, the papi, there's no obvious papilledema, they give them a trial of acetazolamide and if their symptoms improve, then they diagnose them with pseudotumor cerebral. Um, I think that was a fantastic presentation. Um, Thank you. Uh, let me stop the recording a second. Um,